The synagogue of Satan has been interpreted in many different ways by Bible students throughout history. But isn't Jesus Christ himself the best one to interpret the phrase synagogue of Satan? Since I did a video series about the Edomites in episode 15, the synagogue of Satan has been a hot topic on the discussions of some of these videos. My contention is that the synagogue of Satan is referring to the Jews who refused to believe in Jesus Christ during the time of his first advent. Now before we go any further, I would like to stress the point that I am not an anti-Semite. And neither I or God want you to hurt the Jews in any way. There are many times in the Hebrew scriptures where God is angry at the Jews, his people. And he from time to time purges them and refines them and chastises them. But nowhere does he completely give up on them. It is not our job to purge the Jews. It is God's job. We are only studying the prophets to understand who God is and what he wants. And in order to understand this, we look at his dealings with his people, the Jews. This video is focusing upon a time of wrath and of purging of the Jews. Our next video will focus more upon God's eternal love for the Jews. As I explained in previous videos, Biblical Jewish history includes two temple periods. The first temple was built by Solomon around 966 BC and destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar II, King of Babylon, in 586 BC. The second temple was constructed 70 years later, around 516 BC, and destroyed by the Roman general Titus in 70 AD. The second temple was greatly expanded upon and modernized by King Herod the Great in the first century BC. This is the temple that Jesus Christ preached at and prophesied its fall during his ministry. Matthew 24, starting verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, See you not all these things? Verily I say to you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now I mentioned in previous videos that during the time that the Jews were in captivity in Babylon, during the 70 years after Nebuchadnezzar II destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, that the Jews tried as much as possible to carry on the law of Moses in the land of their captivity. It was during this time period that they began to rely much more on an oral Torah. They had the written Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, which were handed to Moses by God and which were kept in the Ark of the Covenant. But the written Torah relies greatly on the sacrificial system, which was carried out in the tent of meeting that was assembled under Moses, which ended up resting in Shiloh for many years. And then that uh, tent of meeting was replaced by Solomon's temple, and the sacrificial system was carried on during the period of Solomon's temple. But in Babylon they had they couldn't follow the sacrificial system. And the written Torah is also very much tied to the land of Israel. And they were no longer in the land of Israel. So the oral Torah is uh, basically it's it's an interpretation that tells them how to follow the law in the land of their captivity, which is pretty much impossible by the letter. So the oral Torah led to almost a new Torah, uh, a different Torah, because it's in a different place under different circumstances. Now they had adapted legal councils since the time of Moses, but these legal councils adapted in form 
through different periods of Jewish history. The Sanhedrin Council, which was the council that was in power during the time of Jesus Christ, that form of the council, the 70 elders, um, divided by political factions, which were basically different religious sects uh, that had different views on certain doctrines, that form of council and the name Sanhedrin, the oldest occurrence of that known, comes from the Hasmonean dynasty of the late Second Temple period. The Sanhedrin Council was the main council of elders in Jerusalem who presided over rulings on religious and secular matters. During the time of Christ, they were under Roman authority, so they did not have complete power, but they had a lot of power in Jerusalem. Uh, this was the council that condemned Jesus Christ to death, but they could not uh, crucify him on the Passover. So they put political pressure on the Roman procurator to do it for them. Now the synagogue system uh, was also developed during the Hasmonean dynasty. The word synagogue is actually a Greek word. It's not a Hebrew word. And it means lead, leading together. And it, uh, under the Hasmonean dynasty, the entire Middle East was under uh, what's called the Hellenistic period. Um, is basically when the Greeks ruled the Middle East and Greek was the universal language of commerce in the entire area. So some Greek words and some Greek things found their way into the Jewish culture and the word synagogue is one of them. Now the Law of Moses is centered at the temple and um, the people would disperse throughout the country, but there were certain holy days during the year where all the people were required to gather at the temple. And uh, the Passover was one of those days. And uh, the synagogue system was basically like a, a smaller building in each of the towns of the country and even outside of the country, in uh, other parts of, of uh, the world, where Jews uh, congregated or lived in groups, they would have this synagogue uh, to meet at every Sabbath, and they would read the scriptures and be taught by the rabbis. And the rabbis had a, like a central system that was centered in Jerusalem, that was the the Mecca of the synagogue system, um, where the, all the, the, the teachers would be trained, and then they would fan out into the different communities. So they would not perform sacrifices at the synagogue. The sacrifices were done uh, in a very specific manner and only in the temple. The synagogue was merely a place of gathering and learning. Now, after the Romans destroyed the temple at Jerusalem, the synagogue system became the primary mode of worship for Jews ever since then. As uh, they could no longer go to Jerusalem, they were expelled by the Romans. But the synagogue system carried on and spread out into different parts of the world. Um, you know, a, a few as the centuries went by, in the first few centuries, um, because of the Jewish-Roman wars which took place, the, the Jews were very much um, shunned by Roman society after a few centuries. And so the, Jew, the Jewish system of synagogues spread out into other empires. Uh, they still existed in the Roman Empire, but it was a lot less comfortable during those years. 
So after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, the, the Christians were sent by Jesus to spread the gospel, uh, beginning among the Jews. So the uh, Christian practice generally was to go into the synagogue every Sabbath and preach Christianity to the Jews. And this became a real problem for the Sanhedrin at Jerusalem. It was an opposing theology uh, by followers of a person whom they had condemned to death. It was considered a blasphemous heresy. Um, they were took steps to eradicate this new sect from their synagogues. Now, as I mentioned before, the apostles had managed to convert several synagogues over to the Christian message. And this uh, led to them being targeted by the Sanhedrin Council. And the Romans during that time were not really interested in internal Jewish arguments over religion. They were more interested in keeping a general peace, and as long as everybody paid their taxes, they, were, they didn't really care about what they believed or what they did. Now, even Jesus himself, um, it was his practice every Sabbath to go to the synagogue, and he preached among the Jews. There are several accounts of Jesus being run out of the synagogue, and uh, he also preached in the markets and in the streets and, and went from town to town spreading his message. And he also preached in the temple several times. And Jesus continually um, said that he was sent to the Jews only during his lifetime. And uh, he included the Samaritans in that. Uh, he preached to the Samaritans and the Jews. Now you might remember from previous videos, I explained who the Samaritans were. They were the people who were brought into the land of Israel after the 10 tribes were taken into slavery. It was an Assyrian practice to um, take people, populations out of their homeland and replace them with other populations who had been taken out of their homeland. And it was a, a tool they used to keep people displaced and keep them weak. So the Samaritans were the ones who were brought into the homeland after the northern kingdom was taken away. And the Samaritans learned of the God of that land, which was Yahweh. And they learned of the temple system and they set up their own temple, which was against Moses' law, but... This caused a competition or animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews. But Jesus, he tended to treat them alike. Um, he did say to the woman at the well, salvation is of the Jews. But he also preached to and healed the Samaritans as a people. And... In that way, he treated them the same as the Jews. He, he didn't really go preaching among Gentiles. That was left for the apostles to do after the resurrection. Um, because the Jews rejected Jesus. And they rejected him by calling for his crucifixion. So up until that time, it was their prerogative to choose him or reject him. If they chose to follow him, then he would have led them to spread the gospel. But they rejected him, therefore he opened it up to the Gentiles. Now this was done, obviously, uh, by God's providence, that the Jews were blinded that we might see. Um, that gets a bit complicated, but that's basically why that it went that way. I'll quickly read here an example of how Jesus um, taught that he was only going to the Jews and that the, late, the, that the Gentiles would come into the picture at a later time. John chapter 12, starting verse 20. 
And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip comes and tells Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, Now you see, the Gentiles were not allowed into the temple, and Jesus was in the temple preaching. So they're asking Philip and Andrew, uh, could we see Jesus? And so Philip gets Andrew, and Philip and Andrew go to Jesus and tell him, there's these Gentiles outside that want to meet you. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. And if any man serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. And if any man serves me, him my father will honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause I came into this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by heard it and said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, The voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. So there he is, he's explaining that it's after the crucifixion that the other nations will have access. After the prince of this world is judged. Now let's take a quick look at the Old Testament prophets, or the Hebrew prophets, about the general ministry of Jesus Christ in this world. Um, Now the prophet Jeremiah was the prophet in Jerusalem, warning the people leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. Uh, The people didn't listen to Jeremiah, what he was telling them, and therefore the destruction followed through and actually took place. Jeremiah chapter 23, starting in verse 5. Now this is about Jesus, remember. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord lives, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord lives, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries whether I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, and like a man who wine has overcome because of the Lord and because of the words of his holiness. For the land is full of adulterers. For because of swearing, the land mourns. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up, and their course is evil, and their force is not right. For both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house I have found their wickedness, says the Lord. Wherefore, their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein, for I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, said the Lord. Now, how was, uh, so he's saying there's a new way coming, a new thing coming, and no more will they say, the Lord who brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But they will say, the Lord who brought 
Israel from the north where he had scattered them. Now we did an episode uh, series all about Ephraim and how Christianity is the fulfillment of uh, Israel being called back out of the lands where they were scattered and being joined with Judah. Judah now being the Jews who became Christians. You see, before the crucifixion of Christ, many Jews, a great number of them, uh, actually believed Jesus and were followers of his. And that is Judah. The ones who rejected him are rejected. So Judah has been pur purged and purified and then joined back to Ephraim as the Christian communities of the Gentiles. Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 31. The same day there came certain Pharisees, saying to him, Get thee out and depart, for Herod will kill thee. And he said to them, Go you and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perishes out of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which kills the prophets and stones them that are sent to thee, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. And verily I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So this is what Jesus said um, leading up to his crucifixion. And the, um, the, the, to the Jews, he said, your house is left to you desolate. And this is the Sanhedrin council and the uh, temple with its sacrificial system that was destroyed and it's still gone. It, it's been gone ever since. Since that time, the Jews have relied on the synagogue system, uh, which is basically what they already had, minus the temple. And he also says, you will not see me again. Now he's speaking God's words to them. And he's saying, your kingdom is left to you desolate, Jerusalem. And you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Until they accept that Jesus is actually representing Yahweh. And so when he says, You will not see me until that happens, that's like a prophecy that that will actually happen. So this is where, again, I say, it's not our job to punish the Jews. It's not our job to fulfill God's wrath that we, as we see um, that there is coming a day when there will be a reconciliation. And that is more geared to the time of the end. Now to carry on with our study, we're going to take a quick look at the persecution of the Christians, uh, how it started. Now, the persecution of Christians began as an internal discipline of the Jewish Christians by the Sanhedrin Council. After the Sanhedrin had condemned Jesus to death, they had Roman soldiers stationed outside of his tomb to make sure that the Christians didn't steal his body away to claim that he had been resurrected or something. And when angels showed up at the tomb, the soldiers ran away. And the soldiers reported to their leadership what had happened, and they were instructed to tell no one. Now after the ascension of Christ into heaven, and after the days of unleavened bread, the apostles received the Holy Spirit and... Uh, began to preach and to heal all around in Jerusalem. 
uh, the Sanhedrin Council had them, some of them arrested, and they were instructed to stop preaching, and they refused because they said that God had commanded us to preach and that his authority is greater than yours. And so the uh, apostles were let go with a strong warning. And then they immediately went out and continued preaching. And when the apostles were healing people and preaching and doing great healing miracles, the news of them went all around the countryside, around Jerusalem, and, and people started to come into the city. And there was great crowds gathering and listening to the apostles' teaching. Um, and they were once again brought before the Sanhedrin Council and put into prison where uh, they were being held until the next day when they would have to stand before the council. And in the morning, they were sent for and they were gone. An angel had transferred them out of the prison. And they were found in the temple preaching. And they were brought into the council and they were once again told not to preach, but they refused. Uh, it was at this time that the uh, great Jewish rabbi Gamaliel, uh, what, who was known as a great teacher, he stood up and he said that, uh, he pointed out that there were other uh, teachers whom uh, they had killed and only made martyrs out of them and that um, they should be careful not to just keep uh, killing people to, and making martyrs out of them. It would only strengthen the movement. And he also pointed out that if this really is God's will, then they cannot stop it. And if it's not God's will, then it will come to an end. And so the council was satisfied with that and so they let the apostles go with a warning and a beating. And the apostles went on preaching again. Now, after that, uh, there was a teacher uh, among the Christians who rose up whose name was Stephen. And he was a, a healer and a preacher. And he uh, often debated with the Pharisees, who were Jewish teachers. And um, the Pharisees could not catch him in debate. Uh, he was very witty. And uh, so they uh, falsely accused him of blasphemy of God and blasphemy of Moses. And he was brought before the Sanhedrin Council where he was condemned to death and he was brought outside of the city and stoned to death and there was a man named Saul who was a Pharisee he was a student of Gamaliel and he stood by everybody's coats while they stoned Stephen to death and this man Saul would later on become the Apostle Paul now, this Pharisee Saul, he uh, then went to the high priest in Jerusalem and he obtained letters of authority to take to Damascus that he would lead a campaign to purge the synagogues of Christians and that he would imprison them and, and even have authority to condemn them to death. And it was on the road to Damascus with this letter that Paul had his great vision of Jesus Christ and was converted into a Christian. And he was baptized in Damascus and he began to preach Christianity from that time. Uh, it was from Damascus where they had to let, them, let him down in a basket down the city wall to get away because there were other Pharisees that were coming to kill him because they had heard that he had changed sides. Um, now, the Apostle Paul, he went, um, it was him who had the greatest influence of 
bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. And he, he was a student of Gamaliel and he was very well versed in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, he um, brought the gospel to a level that was a bit greater than the other apostles. The, uh, the other apostles were all Jews also, and as Paul was. But Paul somehow saw the, the, um, the light of interpreting the gospel in a way that would go to every nation on earth. And he preached it all over Asia Minor, and then he went on into Rome bringing the gospel. Uh, it was his dream to bring it to the city of Rome because Rome was the center of the earth uh, in the Roman Empire. And he knew that um, all the nations around the empire all came to Rome. So he knew that that would make the gospel go to every nation on earth. So Paul brought the gospel to a new level, and he really, um, he became a, a great enemy of the Sanhedrin. Um, they saw him as the, like the leader of the rebellion in many ways. So Paul also, he went um, into every city, he went to the Jews first. He followed the example of Christ. He, he went to the Jews first in any city he went to and then to the Gentiles. So he always started in the synagogue. Now the, the, the Jewish apostles, they, uh, they were Christians and they believed in Christ, um, but they very much held on to their Jewish traditions because they had grown up as Jews. Um, but Paul um, saw the light in a different way he saw the gospel as the light to the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles, you can interpret it as different as nations, the light to the nations. And this is very much prophesied in the Hebrew prophets. And he saw, um, we'll go over a little bit about Paul's gospel, how it transcended the, the, uh, the Jewish teachings. Um, but first, we'll, we'll carry on a little bit about the persecution of the Jews. Uh, King Herod Agrippa the first, he was um, he had uh, been uh, educated in Rome, and when he arrived in Jerusalem as the king of the Jews, he uh, very much wanted to endear himself to the Jewish pe people. And uh, the way he did this was that he took on a role in persecuting the Christians because this was his way of helping the Jews. Um, King Agrippa, he killed James, the brother of John, the apostle, and he imprisoned Peter, the apostle. Uh, these were apostles who were preaching in Jerusalem. And it was his, King Agrippa's. It was King Agrippa's intention to bring Peter out during the Passover festival, just like Christ was brought out, and the people would choose between him and another prisoner. But an angel came in the middle of the night and opened the prison for Peter and let Peter out of the prison. Uh, this is a, a famous occurrence in the Book of Acts. And shortly after that, King Agrippa went to Caesarea, which uh, was the new capital of, of the Judea. Uh, and it was in the amphitheater at Caesarea where Agrippa had this silver suit made out of silver. And the people were calling him a god. And he basically went up in flames in front of them. He died of spontaneous combustion right there. So the Apostle Paul and the other apostles from that time on um, suffered various beatings and um, 
uh, being thrown out of towns and cities. And the Apostle Paul also faced persecution from the Romans because he was also teaching the Gentile converts uh, not to worship the Greek and Roman gods. Uh, it, every city had a patron god and they were very much into idolatry and they had uh, a pantheon of gods which Paul taught against. And so this brought him persecution from both directions, from both the Romans and from the Jews. Uh, for, he went into the synagogues where he faced the rabbis and he also faced the uh, Roman um, centurions who were, uh, because uh, the Gentile converts uh, rioted uh, and, and it began riots among the crowds and Paul was the one blamed and thrown out because of it. Now we'll briefly take a quick look at Paul's gospel and how it takes another step into the new gospel, the new covenant, an, an understanding that um, transcends even what Christ was teaching. Uh, it's it's like the power of the Holy Spirit is now acting among the people and because Christ was limited by the fact that he had not died and resurrected yet because in his death and resurrection this began a new order um, it was the defeat of the of Satan in this world so there were certain things um, that he did not speak of to the Jews when he was in his ministry because these events had not yet taken place. Now that these events had taken place and Christ was crucified and resurrected and he said to the apostles in the Last Supper, he said, unless I go to the Father, I cannot send the Holy Spirit to you. So it was after that he went to the Father, the Holy Spirit came upon the Apostles, and the Holy Spirit brought a new dynamic into um, this was the job of Christians to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And this is uh, like a, another expansion of the message as well. And this was a prophesied event. Uh, I'll take, we'll take a look at again at uh, a prophecy from Jeremiah which talks about the new covenant Jeremiah chapter 31 beginning in verse 31 behold the days come says the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt which my covenant they broke. Although I was a husband to them, said the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest, said the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So this is talking about everybody knowing the Lord, because the Holy Spirit is in everybody to teach them. And the epistle to the Hebrews is an unsigned epistle. Uh, the person who wrote it never let on who they were um, but me and many others there is some debate ab about this among scholars but me and many others um, think that it was the Apostle Paul just because uh, from reading all his, of his other epistles you get to know his style and the epistle of the Hebrews is very much a Pauline style and 
he was, as I mentioned before, he was considered uh, a great enemy to the Jews. And so it would make sense that he would not um, let on to the Hebrews. It's an epistle addressed to the Hebrews that he would not let on to the Hebrews who was writing it because some would simply not read it or have some adversity towards it if they knew it was him. So the style is very much uh, of Paul, but he doesn't actually identify himself in this epistle. Now I'm going to read from the epistle to the Hebrews because um, he is speaking to Hebrews in general. And he gives a very good overview of his view from a Hebrew perspective, his view of the gospel. Uh, and it's in, found in, in Hebrews chapter 8, the entire chapter basically. I'll read it very quickly. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve as an example and a shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished by God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For, see, he says, that thou makes all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also is he a mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises? For if the first covenant had been faultless, then it should have no place have been sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He's quoting Jeremiah here not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people." And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. I will remember no more. And then Paul, uh, that's the end of quoting Jeremiah. And he goes on to say, In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So in the book of Hebrews, he explains how Jesus is the high priest in the tabernacle in heaven. And the new covenant is replacing the old covenant. And that now uh, this covenant has gone out to the, every nation of the world and not only to Jews. In the Old Covenant, there's circumcision of the flesh, which is the Jewish men are circumcised on their penis. The New Covenant is a circumcision of the heart. And now this circumcision of the heart was spoken about by Moses and the Hebrew prophets. Uh, we'll take a look again at Jeremiah chapter 4, starting at verse 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Declare you in Judah and publish in Jerusalem and say, Blow you the trumpet in the land. Gather together and say, Assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense cities. Set up the standard toward Zion. 
Retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. The lion is come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He is gone forth from his place to make the land desolate, and thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. So once again we see the, there is a dual fulfillment in this prophecy. Uh, when Jeremiah was speaking at that time, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was coming from the north to destroy uh, Judah and Jerusalem. And in the time of Jesus Christ, when he was preaching, uh, the kingdom of Rome was coming from the north to destroy Judah and Jerusalem. And in both instances, uh, they are being told to circumcise the foreskin of their heart towards the Lord and not be so hard-hearted towards his message. Now, the Apostle Paul speaks quite extensively about the circumcision of the heart. Um, in his epistle to the Romans, the, the epistle is really written to the Jewish leaders in the Roman synagogue. Uh, he was uh, explaining to them his gospel and explaining to them that he desired to come to Rome someday if God would allow it. Uh, as he was preaching throughout Asia Minor. Now in Paul's day, the main issues that he dealt with uh, regarding, um, he was in a constant um, debate with the Jewish converts, uh, many of whom were previously Pharisees. And uh, the, the main debates with the Jewish converts was over circumcision and over Jew versus Gentile, whether the uh, Gentiles should follow the ways of Moses and whether they should be circumcised. Uh, Paul's contention was that uh, it is of faith and not of the flesh and that you are circumcised in the heart and that every nation on earth is able to adapt the new covenant into their culture uh, rather than all of them adapting Jewish culture under Moses. So now in Romans chapter 2, I'm going to read a, a passage here where Paul is speaking to Jews uh, about the gospel. Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that works good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which do not have the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, meanwhile, accusing or excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now behold, you are called a Jew, and rest in the law, and you make your boast of God, and know his will, and approve the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide of the blind, a light to them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has a form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. You therefore which teaches another, teach, it, teach not yourself. You that preach a man should not steal, do you steal? 
You that says a man should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You that abhors idols, do you commit sacrilege? You that make your boast of the law, through breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profits if you keep the law. But if you be a breaker of the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if, you, if the uncircumcision keeps the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfills the law, judge you who by letter and circumcision do transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is a circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. So now Paul here is, decla is declaring that a Jew, as defined as Judah, is not of the flesh, but of the heart, and of uh, what is in this person's soul that makes him a Jew, and not what is in his flesh. This is also supported by the words of Jesus Christ when he was debating in the temple with the Jews who would not believe him. And it's important to note the parts here where he calls them liars and children of the devil because they wouldn't believe him. Now Jesus was 100% in favor of the law of Moses, but he was not in favor of the oral Torah. He had many disagreements over Jewish customs, which he claimed uh, canceled the Torah out by their customs. And this was his main contention with the Jew, with, with Jewish uh, religion. We look at John chapter 8, starting in verse 30. And as he spoke these words, many believed in him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believe in him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How do you say, You shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say to you, Whoever commits sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abides not in the house forever but the Son abides forever. And if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard from God. And this Abraham did not do. You do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, We are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar." and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's words. 
You therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said to him, Say you not well that you are a Samaritan and has a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me, and I seek not my own glory. And there is one that seeks and judges. Verily, verily, I say to you, if a man keeps my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews to him, Now we know you have a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And you say, If a man keep your saying, he shall never see death? Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. You have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, then I would be a liar like you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so he passed by. So the Jews who believed in him, he, re he called them the children of God. But the Jews who did not believe in him, he called them the children of the devil because they didn't believe in him. And he was judging them by their works. Whether they understood it or not, they did not believe in the God sent forth his son. And that made them the children of the devil because they were in opposition to God. So now that we looked at all of that and we are now ready to take a look at the message to the church in Philadelphia in the book of Revelation. So to give a backdrop of the book of Revelation, the Apostle John uh, was sent to prison by the Romans. Uh, this, is, uh, this book is dated at about 90 AD because in the book of Revelation, it's, uh, the, the destruction of the temple is mentioned in this book and so they date that to say well it must be just after the destruction of the temple so they say well the temple was destroyed in 70 so we'll say 20 years later 90 AD is probably when this book was written um, but they often will do that with the prophets um, they do that to Daniel too where they put a much later date on him because he simply just knew too much about the later history. But he was a prophet. So John could have prophesied shortly before the destruction of the temple. Uh, it's just not that clear. Um, he lived probably, there are some stories and legends about him from his followers that we know of. Uh, so he lived uh, about to about 100 A.D. or so. Um, and so it could have happened at 90 A.D. It could have happened any, you know, any time, really, uh, in that period. Um, now, in the book of Revelation, John is sent to an island called Patmos. It, is a, it was a prison island in the Aegean Sea off the coast of Asia Minor which today would be off the coast of Turkey and in the vision the, the, that John had it begins with Jesus appearing as a godlike figure all white and shining and standing in the midst of seven lamps and the seven lamps are seven churches. And he names these churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And these are uh, seven actual cities that 
um, that were present at that time in Asia Minor. And they are basically the center of the Apostle Paul's ministry. Uh, these seven churches that are named in Revelation, but they're named very figuratively. There's a message to each church, and we're looking particularly at the message to the church of Philadelphia. Um, Philadelphia is another Greek word. It means brotherly love. Um, now, yes, the city of Philadelphia in the United States is named from this uh, church in the Bible. Uh, it was uh, founded by Christians and they named their city Philadelphia because it's uh, one of the churches that um, is very well spoken of by Jesus in his message. So now it's important to understand what is the church in, in the Greek language here. The word being translated as church is ecclesia which means those who are called out. Uh, called out of what? Called out of the world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So he referred to his church as called out. So he's saying those who are called out in Philadelphia. So he's naming each town and saying to the church or the ecclesia, in this town, this is my message to you. So to Philadelphia, he mentions his message to the Ecclesia. Now there's a contrast here because in the message, he mentions some opponents and he refers to them as the synagogue of Satan. So now you notice they are not an Ecclesia they are a synagogue. Um, now that may not mean one particular synagogue. It may mean the synagogue system itself. Uh, it may be talking about the synagogue in Philadelphia. At that time, or even after that time, or before that time, there's only one synagogue system. It's the synagogue of the Jews. And we just read how Jesus referred to the ones who did not believe him as the children of the devil and liars because the devil is the father of a lie. So I want you to keep that in mind as we read this because he's contrasting his church with the synagogue of Satan who are liars and they call themselves Jews, but they are not Jews, they are liars. So we contrast that with, well, what Paul says. A Jew is a Jew who is one inwardly, not who is one outwardly. You see, this is a, in the old covenant, it's by the flesh. And a Jew is a Jew, you know, born of the Jews. In the new covenant, a Jew is a Jew who is one inwardly, and it's a covenant of the circumcision of the heart. So this is the contrast here. And their opposition is the synagogue system. So let's read it now. Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, he's telling John to write to these angels. These things says he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. So now we see here, okay, that he's contrasting the key of David. We studied that in the, in the previous video, that this is the one who is in control of Jerusalem, the one who is the leader of the Jews. So he's saying, I'm the leader of the Jews. Okay, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it. For you have a little strength, and has kept my word, and have not denied my name. So he's speaking to his people, and he's speaking of his power to open and shut. He has set before them an open door. Behold, 
I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now this also speaks of the message going out to the whole world now. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast that which you have, that no man takes your crown. Him that overcomes I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. We've already looked at the uh, contrast of, between the synagogue and the church systems. And, uh, well, not really the church system. His church is the Ecclesiastes. The, uh, it's the people called out. And there is only one church, which is is actually all of God's people united by the Holy Spirit. It is not an organization of men that you go join. Um, there's a lot of churches out there, but that's a different thing than what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about a spiritual kingdom, and those who are led by the Holy Spirit are in unity. And this can include people who are in churches and people who are not in churches. And another contrast that we see here, there's also the contrast between the, uh, the um, key of David versus the synagogue of Satan. So he has taken the keys and he's taken the crown. The crown appears in one of the other messages to the churches. Uh, He's taken the, the um, rulership of David, and now they have rejected him, so he's rejected them. Now the Jews who became Christians, they are in his kingdom, but the Jews who rejected him, are left. their kingdom is left to them desolate. So you see, this is what he's talking about here. Now the other thing he talks about is those who overcome will be a pillar in his temple. And, the, and he also mentions the new Jerusalem. Um, in the book of Revelation, uh, near the culmination at the end of the book, the, uh, the city of Jerusalem comes down out of heaven and the mountain of olives splits in two and it makes a great plain for the new Jerusalem to rest upon. And this is the holy city. Um, Paul mentions that we look for a Jerusalem that is above, which is free, where the Jerusalem now on earth is in bondage with her children. Uh, according to the flesh, we look at a Jerusalem that is in heaven that is free. And it's a, a more... It's more geared towards a spiritual understanding of Jerusalem and the kingdom of God. So I hope that explains more thoroughly my understanding of what is the synagogue of Satan and also how um, the Jews uh, have kind of um, l lost their standing and they have become... It's not that they've completely lost it. They have been set among the other nations in an equal standing with other nations. Uh, that they are being presented the gospel and they still have a chance to accept it or deny it, uh, as every nation does. There's a principle that happens throughout the Hebrew scriptures and the Greek scriptures is that what has happened to Israel happens to every nation because if God's people have to go through it, then everybody's got to go through it. So 
this is uh, the Jews are kind of being separated and being purged as those who have not accepted yet apart from those who have accepted and you even see that happening today they have uh, messianic Jews and then there's the normal Jews who are in the synagogue uh, in the synagogue system still and this this goes right up to the end and there's end time prophecies that kick in uh, are centered around Jerusalem and Israel this is why many Christians will teach that uh, 1948 when the nation of Israel declared itself a nation once again under the secular Jews uh, this began the time of the end which is a prophetic time period and that these events centering around Jerusalem lead us up to the time of the end and the final fulfillment of all the prophets. So this brings us to the end of part 5 of episode 18. And once again, I would like to stress the point that this is not meant to disparage the Jews. This is um, just a study of uh, a, a period in history when the Jews were under chastisement. Uh, there are several parts of the Jewish history where God chastises them because they are his children and he chastises his children and he purifies them. And it's like it, all through the Bible, not every Israelite is God's people. Many of them were evil and many of them are good. They, they're constantly being sorted. Um, and it's true with every nation. So it's not our job to sit here and look at the Jews as uh, that God hates them and it's our job to hate them too. That's not the point. Of the, of the Bible and that's not the point that I'm making that's been a problem um, among Christians in, in history uh, because of these kind of Bible studies they, they in medieval times and in various other times they start looking down upon Jews but again I'll make the point that if you think Jesus died for you then you killed them not the Jews. So I, I think our next video will conclude the series about Judah and the Jews and um, the next video will just be a cap off of a, a talk about the Jews today and, and how, how are they presented in prophecy in the Hebrew prophets and perhaps in Christian prophecies. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.